get where we got on the 8th uh, of November, but thank you, Andriana. It is truly a pleasure to be uh, joining you uh, this afternoon. We have had many uh, consultations to get here and uh, have ensured that we are bringing so many people uh, with us uh, to this particular event and moment. It is particularly critical for us because we are looking at this five-year plan for the improved Marrakesh partnership for enhancing ambition uh, that is welcomed by parties, that was welcomed by parties at COP26. Now there's already so much momentum and appetite to tackle waste management as this provides short and long-term gains in a climate change environment, pop population, human health, and livelihoods. Something that was said in the video really caught my attention. And it wasn't necessarily by the way Desta said it, but it was the message that it was conveying that certainly us failing to deal with waste management reflects that we are classist. Because those that are most harmed by issues of waste are the poor and the vulnerable. So if we do not deal and tackle the matters and deal with waste management adequately, we are basically perpetuating healthcare issues, perpetuating inequality, perpetuating dirty air for those that are most vulnerable in our communities. So the urgency is very clear. We've been talking about sustainable development goals. We've been talking about inclusivity. There's certainly no doubt that we must include and accelerate the process of waste management in development. Waste management is a very critical issue of sustainable development, whether we want to admit it or not. But I know that everybody in this room is uh, the converted, so. Uh, it's preaching to the converted, but we hope that the messaging that comes out of this meeting reaches those that are still wondering why waste management is part of a climate agenda. It should be very clear that there are many opportunities and many changes that are happening in our economies. And we know we need to be able to really tag on the momentum that has already been built. So for us, we recognize the critical importance of addressing open waste burning. And with, in our office, with the high level champions, we collaborate with the Engineering Acts Program of the Royal Academy of Engineering and the Lloyds Registered Foundation and have launched the initiative on eliminating open waste burning in September of 2021. And the initiative, working with a number of strategic partners, brought the issue of open waste burning in Africa to major environment and climate forums, including the 26th session of the Conference of Parties on Climate Change and the fifth United Nations session, environmental assembly. This was followed with series of virtual sessions and forums that were organized by some of our key partners. But one of the highlights of this year, the Road to COP, has been that we have managed to work with the Bureau of the African Ministerial Conference on Environment, AMSEN, and they decided to address the issue of open waste burning as part of its substantive agenda of the 18th session of AMSEN. And this meeting and this session was held in September of 2022. After very detailed deliberations during the technical and the ministerial segments of AMSEN, AMSEN adopted a decision resolution on eliminating open waste burning in Africa. And the decision resolution included key actions that needed to be taken by African countries, by African countries and development partners. And it was called for the establishment of a multi-stakeholder 
partnership of the elimination of open waste burning from Africa. As a follow-up to this decision, the strategic partners, our strategic partners who have been working closely on this initiative will launch this partnership at the 27th session of the Conference of Parties, COP27 on climate change. And to give you more information on that, we uh, call on you, before I close, we call on you all to collaborate with us as we work towards the launch of this multi-stakeholder partnership on a multi-stakeholder partnership on achieving 60% reduction of open waste burning by 2030 and fully phase out open waste burning from Africa by 2050. Now this will happen on the 15th of November and the official opening will happen, the official launch will happen at 12 o'clock at the Solutions Pavilion. I got it right, Sandrian. All right, good, good, good. And so as I close, I want to recognize, of course, the lot of work that has been done by many of our partners. But I most importantly want to recognize the COP27 Presidency's Global 50 by 2050 Waste Initiative. We have fully aligned ourselves with this initiative and we have worked in support of this initiative. And it will be launched setting the ambition to treat and recycle at least 50% of the waste produced in Africa by 2050. And by achieving this target, Africa would contribute to increase the global waste treatment rate by approximately 10% and reduce overall effects of waste population on human health, biodiversity, food systems, and resource scarcity. So I believe that we are all aligned in this. And what is important to raise is that to achieve all of our goals, the initiative seeks to catalyze greater investment and efforts to develop the African waste management ecosystem and address the challenges that are deeply rooted in this problem. And we need to increase financing and investment to treatment of waste and to recycling capabilities and capacities. Set, and we need to set the necessary level of policy making and raise global awareness. And as I conclude, it's not just about raising global awareness, but making sure that we are taking a global issue to, and regionalizing it and localizing it. The only way we can be able to truly catalyze climate action and ensure effective implementation is if we take these very technical matters to the people that actually matter. And with that, I thank you, and I, I wish you good deliberations. Andriana. Thank you very much. And so to come from that very remarkable opening remarks, I'd like to invite Ms. Martina Otto. She um, will be talking to us, actually, um, about transform transformative action in the waste sector. And leading from Bogolo, or taking it from Bogolo, then she'll talk about um, examples from countries and cities of the partners that she's working with. Ms. Martina Otto has over 25 years of experience in environmental policy and governance, um, focusing on energy buildings, transport, sustainable cities, as well as partnership building. I know partnerships is something we'll often talk about, so it's great to have, here, to have her here. So welcome, Ms. Martina Otto. Hand of welcome, please. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you. And uh, let, me, let me start by saying waste has made it onto the radar. This is the first time that the sector has risen to such prominence at the COP, and that is for a good reason. The UNEP Climate and Clean Air Coalition Global Methane Assessment highlighted that waste is responsible for about 20% of global anthropogenic methane emissions. 
according to Regions 20. Globally, 41% of all waste is burned with higher percentages in developing countries. And this burning often occurs in dump sites, contributing to toxic air pollution, including um, black carbon emissions. And this is non-trivial, as both methane and black carbon have a global warming potential that is much higher than that of CO2. And they have a shorter lifetime in the atmosphere. This makes them our best shot at keeping 1.5 in reach. And to do so, we need to reduce methane emissions from the waste sector by 30 to 35 percent from 2020 levels, and reductions of 29 to 36 uh, tons per year by 2030 were found to be possible with proven and targeted measures. Now, there's a game changer that has come in, and that's satellites. They are now able to detect super emitting sources of methane emissions. And uh, GHGSAT has identified actually more than 100 super emitting landfills around the world. And while local governments had an idea of where those landfills were, um, the satellite images make these sites extremely visible. And that allows us to mobilize the resources that we need to tackle these point sources quickly. And there's no reason to, to act. I already mentioned it's about measures that are proven. And as much as 60% of waste sector targeted measures have actually negative uh, or low cost. And literally all the measures do come with a strong case for action from a social economic perspective as well. And there is no time to lose. The trend does actually go in the wrong direction. Global waste generation is expected to grow from uh, two, uh, 2 billion tons uh, today to 3.4 billion uh, tons by 2050. And the World Bank's recent report, uh, Water Waste 2.0, um, actually uh, pointed out that the quantity of waste generated in low-income countries is expected to increase by more than three times by 2050. So that means we really have to act fast. I also wanted to highlight the issue of food waste, um, as we're at the moment as well facing a food crisis. And because food waste is actually a real uh, responsible for emissions as well, and counter all beliefs, Food waste occurs literally everywhere where it's being measured, where measurements are made. So it's not only a developed country problem. So it's therefore a real major stop, except what we heard um, about the Amsen decision, um, about the multi-stakeholder partnership that is being started. It's fantastic. The, 20, the, the 50 by 2050 initiative of Egypt, um, really bringing the topic very much to this, uh, to this COP as well and making it a cornerstone under the presidency. And under the Global Methane Pledge, launched uh, last COP, we're also looking at a waste pathway, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that later. Um, but we need to tackle the methane side of things. Now that we have all, the, all this political buy-in, we must build on this momentum. We have concrete actions that are proven to protect both the climate and human health, and we must implement them at scale and now. And the NDCs are a good way to actually help us drive the scale of implementation. And uh, the issue is not captured sufficiently in the, in the NDCs. So what to include? It's about reducing and valorizing organic waste. And let me emphasize again, landfills are not a solution. They are part of the problem. And um, I will not go into all the problems of that, but what instead we need to look at is the solid waste management, both residential and industrial. We need to look further upstream as well, behavioral change to reduce consumer waste in the first place. And there is a whole kind of sea of, of, uh, of measures that can be taken. Governments can lead by example through schools, hospitals, administration, procurement decisions that are being made, work with the retailers, um, but also diverting food waste with food banks and so on. And I, I definitely don't want to leave out this issue of the whole of government and the NDCs are, you know, if they're done in a way that is very consultative, including all the levels of government but also the communities, we get to those whole of government approaches to bridge the gap between the ambition and the implementation. 
And uh, it's very clear that waste management is not only a responsibility of cities and towns, and it's not uh, an agglomeration of individual um, strategies that are out there, but it has to be a holistic approach across the national territory. There has to be this vertical integration between policy and we have to see as well that the local governments are getting the means uh, to take on this, this task in a way that's commensurate with the opportunities. It's about the responsibilities, but it's also about the finance, for example. And I also wanted to highlight the fact that it really is not only an environmental issue, it's a matter of sustainable development to tackling waste. There are significant climate, health, and economic benefits from taking action. And um, I already alluded to some of the health benefits from reducing open burning, and we heard that very compellingly as well. So we definitely must ban open burning. That's, that's a real um, key to take things forward. And I spoke about methane, but I really want to highlight as well that this is not only a climate issue, but methane uh, emitted against the backdrop of, uh, of air, air pollution is forming tropospheric ozone, which again has health impacts, but also has impacts on um, the ecosystems and uh, our food production systems, and through that, uh, further down the line, food security. So it's really critical to address that from also those angles. There are economic benefits that should not be dismissed. And according to, for example, the Africa Waste Management Outlook done by UNEP in 2018, 70 to 80 percent of the municipal solid waste generated in African cities is recyclable with an estimated economic value of 8 billion per annum. It's estimated that only 11 percent of this waste is recycled and that shows us the scale of the opportunity that is out there, the opportunity for economic development and for jobs. But talking about that, there's the social side and we heard a little bit of an allusion on that uh, already. And the moment we talk about all these win-win situations, we need to be cognizant of the fact there is not, not, not everybody is on the winning side. There may be people who may be threatened by this, they may lose out, but we have to address those topics head on, not to stop the good measures from taking place, but putting into place the right kinds of safeguards, bringing the communities on board, the stakeholders that may actually be impacted by that, Look at training, look at building further capacity and looking at building safety nets for them. But um, Andriana said it already, we are also celebrating action. Countries are already taking important steps and at the CCIC we're really happy that we were able to support a number of those activities. Just to mention Argentina and Costa Rica, they are implementing methane reductions through organic waste diversion and use. The city of Buenos Aires is developing an organic waste management strategy. In Peru, we're linking waste management and protein production through insect technology, transposing what has already been tested elsewhere, the black soldier fly insect technology in a different context. We will hear later from colleagues on a new waste management bill signed into law in Kenya and the implementation of Chile's national organic waste strategy. The CCAC is beginning a new set of projects in Benin, Central African Republic, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Jordan, Maldives, Morocco, and Togo. So you've seen there's a whole train that is in motion. In sum, don't waste the waste. Develop holistic policies for ambitious goals. The next round of NDCs must outline these goals in the waste sector to help us mitigate methane, black carbon emissions, and forge a whole of government approach. Finance must be commensurate with the opportunity internationally and at home. And now that the waste sector is on the radar, radical cooperation is in order. And at the CCIC, we do stand ready to work with, uh, with all of you to provide support. Uh, join the CCIC Waste Hub. That's a vibrant place for the exchange as well. And in that circle, we are already working together with key players, including the C40, the Global Methane Hub, um, and the high-level champions team. With that, I look forward to the discussions. Thank you.
Thank you very much for those remarks. And I would like to tell you that we are now done with the opening remarks, and I would like to call up my panel, who is, uh, the, it's comprising of very exciting different institutions and um, different key stakeholders. So the first one, and as I call out your name, please come up to the panel, and then I'll introduce how we're going to do the panel, but also give you an opportunity to interact with the panel through the question and answer session. So the first one to come to the stage, uh, please welcome Dr. Nagwa El Karawi. Dr. Nagwa is the focal point of the COP27 Global 50 by 2050 Waste Initiative, representing the Ministry of Environment, Egypt. So Dr. Nagwa will remind you that it is a 50 by 2050 global initiative from Egypt to Africa. And I don't know why people are not excited about that. So welcome, Dr. Nagwa. Please welcome her. And then next on the stage, I'd like to call Joshua. Joshua, are you here? Did Joshua get lost on the way here? I don't see Joshua. But um, when Joshua comes into the room, and I'll send a text to ask where Joshua is, but Joshua Ampensem is the World Climate Ambassador and Facilitator. He's the founder of Green Africa Youth Organ Organization, and hopefully he is able to find his way here. If he's online, please remember to come to Action Room 1 at Ibis. <clears throat> Next to call onto the stage is Luanda. I think, Luanda, I see you sitting at the front. Luanda is a reclaimer with Africa's Reclaimers Organization and representative of the International Alliance of Waste Speakers. Welcome, Luanda. Please applause. <laughs> then, um, Erica. Erica, are you here? Erica, make a sign of life. Erica is here. Great. Welcome, Erica Rosenthal. Erica is a senior attorney at the Earth Justice. Please applause as she comes up. Uh, Professor Marcelo Mena, are you here? Yes. Uh, welcome. He's a CEO of the Global Methane Hub. Gareth Phillips, Africa Development Bank, is here. Gareth Phillips is the, in the climate and environmental finance. He's a climate and finance expert. So it's great to have you here, Gareth. Stephen, are you here? Yes. It's like roll calling class. I'm quite enjoying this. People should be saying yes, madam. <laughs> uh, Stephen, come up. Stephen is an advisor at Global um, Climate Policy and Strategy. Yes, I can take. I can take one back. I can. Yeah, you can sit there. So, Stephen, we need to find Stephen a seat as well. I will call you Stephen as we as we pose the question to you. Wow, I had such a big panel. I ran out of seats. I like that. So, um, as they're coming up to the stage, I would like to introduce the key points of this discussion, or rather, to remind you because I think they have been repeated in the opening remarks. And we will continue to discuss them as we go along. Now, um, the, discuss, the discussion is meant to showcase success at the national and subnational level, but also discuss roadblocks to improving waste management infrastructure. We need to take into account critically the informal sector, but also to discuss the next steps on how to encourage sustainable and integrated waste management, circular economies, so that we nurture the collaboration that is needed. Now, but also to remind you that organic waste makes up the largest a share of municipal solid waste across the world, across all cities, rural areas, it doesn't matter where you're looking this from. Organic waste, food, and green waste um, makes up about 50% of the waste. So that's actually good news. This is a good opportunity to achieve the ambitions of the different initiatives that we've introduced here by working on reducing and valorizing organic waste in particular by tackling global food loss and waste, which, which account for a significant proportion of the organic waste. But also to look at improving the management of organic waste, which will lead to significant, as you've heard from uh, Martina, for, uh, uh, significant methane reductions. But also we are looking at phasing out plant and spontaneous open burning of waste, which requires transformational change in the waste management sector, to look at the transition from piecemeal interventions to systematic trans transformations. This will require a paradigm shift, but I think here, the actors in this room and beyond, we are quite capable of doing this. Now, the panelists are looking at each three, uh, three minutes as I pose these questions. But I think um, I want to start with Dr. Nagwa. Dr. Nagwa, who actually I had the opportunity to meet earlier on this year, and uh, first virtually, of course, and then in person. And for the first time, I attended a waste meeting where there were more than two women in the room. 
So I'm actually quite glad to see a number of women here. But um, from that session, we spent a good 30 minutes just talking between myself and, and Dr. Nagwa. And at that time, I think it was then told to us, maybe we should have a side meeting to continue talking about waste. So the good news is Dr. Nagwa and myself look this excited every time when you're talking about waste. So Dr. Nagwa, posting this question to you. As the focal point of the 50 by 2050, introduce, introducing in the final resolution an official call for all African countries and institutions to join the global initiative, where ministers pledge to tackle plastic wastes and open waste burning, I want to ask you, why was it important to have the AMSEN support and what does it change for the future of this initiative? How did this happen? What were the key factors that led to this historic pledge? Dr. Nagwa, please. This should be a microphone next to you. Excellent. Hello? Yes. <laughs> First, I have to thank you for having me back. We have been through this with uh, Adriana and with the uh, um, with UNHLC for a while. And actually, um, it's a collaboration between both of us. Why it was important for Amson to do, uh, to say, uh, to already mention us in the resolution last September, because of what happened today. We are in the opening remark. We are now being discussed everywhere. Uh, we have so many sessions about waste management in COP27. Let's be uh, clear that why was the rationale for 50 by 2050 is that so far, COP actually, in COP until this COP27 meetings, um, they didn't focus greatly on waste management actually. So it was, despite its direct impact on all of the SDGs, direct impact on all the NDCs and ESGs. But for that, we were thinking why waste was not highlighted. And for that, we have been working with all the parties, all the uh, activities, and all the agencies in the region. And we have reached that to be mentioned in an open remarks in COP27, we have the chance to have the launching on the 17th. Please welcome and join us. It's going to be here in the 17th at 2.30. Um, and uh, we actually have a few sessions in the green zone in the 14th and the 16th. I will be able to provide, actually, um, you can have all the information from uh, the QR codes. Uh, Amson was important for us because in Amson we realize we can't go with only one language, so that's why we have it English, French, and Arabic. So the brochure now in three languages because we would like to be able to able to talk to all Africa. Uh, this initiative it's gonna be launched from Egypt, but it is for Africa for a global impact. It will be covering all waste type, and that's the difference, and that is the edge of, of, of uh, 50 by 2050. It looks at the whole continent, at the whole waste type, all waste type, and it has five different working groups where it will be covering all waste from all aspects, including actually EPR, Extended Producer Responsibility because that's what we are looking for. We are looking for how we can have the right data. We are looking for the infrastructure, which is estimated to be over 300 billion in or dollars in order to be able to treat 50% by 2050. That's lots of work ahead of us, but Amazon is a huge support of us. We have over 100 entities are now supporting and working uh, with uh, registering with 50 by 2050. And we are very happy to welcome more. Please take a look at the brochure and join us in our meetings and in the launching. And we'll be very happy to answer all your questions. And please, this is an integrated waste management initiative. So let's have this approach. We don't look at one kind of waste. Any kind of waste, if it's not treated correctly, is going to be a hazardous waste. So let's look at all type of waste and let's work together 
for Africa for a global impact. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So um, coming from uh, Dr. Nagwa, I would like to invite Luyanda. Luyanda, you know, I want to talk to you as somebody representing the informal sector. You are very aware that most people are impacted by poor waste management. Historically, the informal sector has not been included in these kind of sessions, in the kind of planning, in investment, in financing. Now, we want to change that paradigm and change that as a, a, a challenge by saying that we are starting to see the inclusivity happening for the informal sector. Now, what role do you think waste management associations that you work with can play in advancing the kind of initiatives and pledges that we are seeing? Welcome, Luanda. Thank you, thank you very much for having us. Um, I think let's start with some facts. Um, we have a lot of the informal sector globally making a huge difference that is not being recognized. Um, I'll start in Argentina where 49,533 tons is being diverted of, 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 of carbon emissions, being diverted on an annual basis. We have 80 to 90% of post-consumer packaging being diverted informally by reclaimers in South Africa. Um, we have cooperatives in India that prevent about 1.4 tons of CO2 equivalent a year simply by operating manual push carts instead of the, 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 the petrol diesel system. We have a proper working system that has been subsidized in government that has been subsidizing business, and that has been subsidizing the environment, mostly through a free labor system. And I strongly believe now is we're not, we're not the informal sector, we are the sustainable sector. We have reclaimers in South Africa who are already starting to divert food waste and making a point that they're providing enough gas to be able to supply crutches that are being built from recyclable materials that we are disposing. That's already sustainable solutions that are actually happening from the ground. Why is the problem? Lack of proper engagement, lack of proper meaningful engagement. Because engagement is there, it, but not all the time is it meaningful. There's not proper solutions coming from the ground. We have thousands of people that have been doing waste collection for more than two decades and they have been diverting so much waste without any support. Diverting tons of plastics without any infrastructure, without any form of support. Solution, proper engagement, meaningful engagement. Let's start by working with something that's already working and not come up with things that are very new that are not properly researched have not been tested, and actually end up having unintended consequences to the livelihoods of people that don't want to do crime, that have no jobs, but are doing something to be able to earn a living, and in that process, subsidizing everyone in the system. So what, what, what is it that we can do as civil societies? We are trying very hard to engage with everyone to create that proper, inclusive, circular economy. The sexual, it cannot be inclusive if you are avoiding the people that are doing the actual work. We are doing the collection. Business must do their part. We need to be there when business needs to start deciding on EPR. We need to advise. Maybe we don't need to buy trucks. Maybe we need to find other ways of investing. We need to be able to engage directly with the people that are the masters, the professionals, and that has been subsidizing the whole process. Why are we talking now? Because there's a problem. There has not been conversations because there were no problems. Now that the problems are here, yes, there is engagements. And we do acknowledge that we play a very huge part, but is government acknowledging it? Is the private sector acknowledging it? I think the, the, the first step that needs to be done, as I said, proper, meaningful engagement, because we do have the solutions. We are already diverting it. So finding solutions and coming and creating that inclusive circular economy would be the first step of going forward. Thank you very much, Leander. 
I think we are hearing this again and again. Proper, inclusive economies, meaningful engagement. And I think we are very fortunate to have Erica here because, because Erica, working in NGO, Earth Justice, you have been involved in developing and drafting sustainable waste management policies, particularly in Kenya. Can you give us some details about the policy making process? Do you see lessons from Kenya for other countries? And I want to throw you one more and say, in this case of inclusivity, it can, is it found within the policy making? So Erica, please go ahead. Good afternoon. So thank you for that. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. The Sustainable Waste Management Law in Kenya was signed just a few months ago in July after a six-year process. And my organization, a group of public interest environmental lawyers, was involved uh, as part of a technical assistance package by the Climate and Clean Air Coalition. But I want to say that we were there to support really a huge group of Kenyan leaders on this issue. Visionary people in the government, waste, collection, uh, waste pickers, collectives, youth organizations, and many others. So I hope I do them all justice in running down uh, some parts of the process. So I'll make three comments maybe on the process. The first is that, of course, it responded to public pressure. In many, like in many other countries where economies and cities had grown rapidly, the waste problem had grown into a health and environmental crisis. Uh, in many areas, there was little or no collection. The country had a number of very, has, has still a number of very large open dump sites, including Dandora, which is the largest in Africa outside of Nairobi. Waste pickers were working in deplorable conditions. Toxic fumes and leachate were contaminating neighborhoods neighboring uh, communities, so there was real public pressure for change, and that's what motivated. So the second thing I'd say is that the process really did benefit from the input of many stakeholders. Not enough input, but it was a really good first, first step. We also had peer-to-peer -peer learning, which was really important. So through the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, we were able to bring experts from South Africa, including somebody from the National Department of Environment who had participated in the adoption and drafting of the 2008 South African law that could sort of lay out a vision for what Kenya could achieve and how long and difficult the process might be. We also brought a technical expert from Etiquini from the Durban landfill, which is a model in Africa at the time of, and still is, of an integrated approach uh, community uh, with community employment, reforestation in a buffer zone, the first landfill gas to electricity project in the continent. The Environment Ministry created a, a, a multi-agency steering committee for the drafting and development of the waste law to keep everybody on board and push the process forward. And then maybe most importantly, the draft bill benefited, once, once there was a draft, it benefited from the constitutionally required public consultation process. So teams went out to uh, six uh, parts, of, six places across the country to get the critical inputs from counties because in, South, in Kenya, like in many other places around the world, it's the counties that have the devolved responsibility to local government to actually provide the service, and it's their responsibility. And to get the input from local recyclers, from local waste pickers, from civil society organizations and communities. And then the third thing I'll say is that really the objective from the start uh, was to come up with a really ambitious law for Kenya. And it is ambitious. Uh, I really commend it all to you to, to read it. Um, but that means that the process is ongoing. The hard work has just begun. Because now the country needs to develop this, a, a very large suite of enabling regulations that are mandated in the law to actually make it implementable, to, to, sort of the, to create the beating heart of the law. And those include the adoption of regulations on tax incentives. I have to read it here because it's a long list. Uh, on tax incentives to incentivize private investment in transport, compacting, collection, uh, and, and recycling and treatment facilities to require waste segregation at the source, and then standards for organic compost to make sure that you have a quality product that can increase the market, the operation of a national waste management council to bring everybody together to provide guidance and support to local, to local government uh, to collect data and report on progress. 
uh, regulations on the closure of open dump sites, on incentives to expand the market for recycled products, including through government procurement, facilitation and creation of waste, pardon me, of waste collection and recycling cooperatives, and very importantly, uh, regulations on extended producer responsibility. And those are going forward. There's actually a draft now, and that'll be a real step change for the country. So uh, the second part of your question was, uh, you know, lessons learned from this process. And every country has its own national circumstances, so I'm just going to maybe make three very, very high-level suggestions of lessons learned. One was that peer-to-peer -peer exchange, South-South peer-to-peer exchange was really important, critical approach to sort of laying out the vision of what could be accomplished. The second, and I think this is what you were really underlining, is that the more inclusive the process is, the more civil society and communities are involved, the more robust and ambitious the law will be. And then the third uh, is that in a framework law like the Kenyan Sustainable Waste Management Act, and this is what our South African colleagues emphasized from the very beginning, you really, really matters that you're ambitious. You won't get an opportunity probably to do this again for many, many years. So the, the law should really set a high bar. And happily in Kenya, I believe that's what has happened. Thank you very much. So I think taking from here, we want to hear from Marcelo Mena. He's the CEO for Global Methane. And to you, Marcelo, what I would, I would like to know, um, as the former Environment Minister for Chile, what were some key factors in Chile's success? And how can the Global Methane Hub support countries that are ambitious, that want to create a holistic approach to waste management? Great. Thank you for the invitation. And when the COP27 presidency announced that they will be working on waste for the 50 by 50 initiative, we were very excited to be able to contribute. And because it's, environment ministers also understand that while we have climate commitments, we have a ticking time bomb on waste management. And many times we have to really address it. There's, nobody wants a new landfill nearby. They're ending their life. They're catching fire. There's open burning, and so we need to look at this urgently. It also accounts for 18% of emissions, but all, in the developing world, 93% of um, sites are, or the trash is going to open dumps. But now with the satellite observations, we've been able to also see that even the best facilities that we thought were doing the best job are actually methane super emitters. For example, the Buenos Aires landfill emits around 23 tons of CO2 per, uh, sorry, 22 tons of methane per hour, which is around 4 million tons equivalent per year. Almost half of Buenos Aires' methane emissions are in that landfill. But we could solve it. Reduce 90% of the emissions, for example, if we cap these leaks the same way that we're doing in other operations in oil and gas. So that's why we're excited to have launched this week a uh, report of the 200 major super emitters uh, with Estron and JGCSAT, but also with uh, Secretary Kerry announcing this scale initiative, $3 million that we're putting forward to help C40 uh, cities work on this. Mumbai, Bangalore, Accra, Dakar, Addis Ababa. We can provide information so facility operators can reduce the emissions today. But also we need to be thinking about what we are going to do on emissions later. And that's why it's important that we work with uh, other partners like RMI and CATF and uh, Carbon Mapper, who put together uh, 3,000 um, landfill information uh, with a NASA instrument uh, starting this next year. It's very much in line with the IMEO. So the data is provided for communities uh, to demand change, but also useful for operators so they could reduce those emissions because nobody wants to be on those 200 major super emitters. And that's why when we met with mayors, they were so excited to be able to address this for multiple reasons, including the fact that you could also reduce odor control, uh, or you could control odors and therefore benefit communities from this. Finally, I just wanted to say with the EPR and other things, when Chile uh, addressed, uh, when we got into OECD, they said we should do EPR law. And it was very interesting. And we've been working on rules for six years, and we still haven't implemented it. What I've been talking to OECD, and they're going to put out a, a small report next week, that maybe we should start with organic waste. Because in the developing world, this has largely been solved. But when you have to start from scratch, 
it might be easier to address 60 to 70 percent of your emissions or, or your waste, which is organic waste. And then it's much easier to do recycling when you take, you know, it's much smaller volume. And so I think that's something we could start looking into. And then we start discarding false solutions like incineration, which I think lock us into other uh, systems that are really not going to reduce. That's why we're supporting the Global Food Banking Network. So we have the benefits of addressing what's the environmental and climate benefits from also reducing food waste. And the full package we're putting together for next week is uh, around $20 million full within, between all the work that will be uh, addition to the things that we're already supporting for the CCAC. So we came here, we believe it's important. The Methane Hub is based out of Santiago. It's uh, got this Global South feel, and we believe we could bridge the gap between developing worlds and the developed world with uh, the implementation that we've done in Chile too. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I hear that Joshua is in the room, but before I call you up, Joshua, because we've run out of seats, but we can remain standing. I'm enjoying standing. So um, I'll first call Stephen, who's been waiting for a bit. Stephen, um, you're going to have to come up here and uh, take over this spot. But Stephen's question is actually, as uh, World Bank's advisor on global climate policy and strategy, and this one is an important one, because a lot of you who are in this room who are already working on waste, you're wondering about financing. So question to Stephen is, what innovative investment opportunities exist for developing countries to fund the waste infrastructure gap to ensure inclusivity and protection of livelihoods? How can the World Bank ensure the needs expressed for partnership and collaboration with key actors is sustained? And I see your founder seat. So Stephen, take it away. Thank you very much. Um, appreciate the opportunity to join you here today. Before I, I get to that question, I think I wanted to, to raise one important issue that we've seen over time, and that is the need to move from beyond kind of a, I'll call it a system element issue, to a broader system construction framework. Because in years past, we may well have said, okay, we're gonna target this particular issue or that particular, in terms of recycling or in terms of landfill gas management or in terms of the collection system, but increasingly, we've been moving to a broader system approach. And the, the sense we've had, and this is coming from teams operating in, in locations around the world, is that you need to focus on the financial sustainability, the operational sustainability, as well as the environmental sustainability. And so, if the municipality or the operator can't finance their daily operations because they have inadequate revenue generation or unstable flow of resources from the government, then it's going to fall apart. Um, if they can't adequately monitor the contracts that have been established with suppliers or vendors, service contractors, it's going to fail. If they're able, if they don't have the off-taker agreements for any commodities that they may have diverted from the waste stream, then that particular aspect of the system is going to fall apart. So again, we've really been thinking very comprehensively in terms of how do we work with our clients, our counterparts in a way that addresses all of these issues. Now that then links to the financing instruments that we choose to use. And there, there are several that we can, we can promote. So part of it is, uh, and again, you, you have to focus on what is the basic source of funds to finance this. Is it a user fee? Is it a, a, a general contribution by government or central government or regional government? You know, as the, as the basis for the majority of the, the uh, coverage of the budget. Um, but sometimes to, um, for some of the capital improvements, there are things that you can do in terms of an array of cities or countries where these kinds of ideas have been pursued. We also have performance-based grants, so if you get above a certain threshold in terms of total amount of waste that's collected, then you're eligible for more additional resources or perhaps a, an advanced concessional rate. So you're incentivized to do better in terms of how you run the system. Third, we also have, in, in the World Bank and maybe um, uh, Gareth can talk about what, how AFDB does it, but you know, some of the multilateral development banks, some of the regional banks have what's known as development policy loans, which are a lending instrument that has policy triggers that go along with it. 
So it, it's a obligation that if in return for the resources, which may have fewer <coughs> conditions on t uh, applied to how that money can be spent, but you're obliged to follow particular policy um, uh, uh, <coughs> regimens that can, can do things like in Morocco, where the government mandated that all informal sector <coughs> players um, had to be incorporated into the private sector contract. So that was a policy prescription that we insisted upon as part of the loan agreement. And then you have the traditional loan structure. Um, but the one thing I also want to finish with is um, uh, what we call the pilot auction facility. It's actually phasing out this year. It was structured as an experiment. Um, I, I see Marina uh, uh, you know, nodding, um, remembering uh, what we did with it. If, if you're familiar with the idea of a, a reverse auction, a reverse auction is not trying to maximize the revenue, it's trying to minimize the cost. And so here, we, were, we had a pool of money that had been raised, and that was made available, access to that pool of resources was made available to bidders who would say, we will do X for Y dollars. And so in this case, it was targeting methane capture, and uh, again, the goal was to drive down the cost, find the most efficient contractors, the most efficient system structures in a way that minimized the amount of public money that actually had to be allocated to that. So there are lots of innovations like this out there that we've been experimenting with. I know that other financial institutions have, have pursued them as well. But there are a lot of ways to, to get at this issue. But I go back to the first point, which is, but you have to think comprehensively because if one piece falls apart, a lot of other elements of the system are going to fall apart too. And so we, we're very focused on this entire system structure uh, framework. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. I think the converse of that statement is that when things, a lot of things can also fall together. So with that in mind, I'd like to invite Joshua. Joshua is a world climate ambassador and facilitator. Just to remind you, and I've met Joshua many times through different, um, actually, uh, different platforms. And uh, he's also the founder of Green Africa Youth Foundation. Organization, sorry. Welcome, Joshua. Thank you. <laughs> I was just going to say, Joshua, do you want to freestyle? So I do have a question for you, Joshua. Joshua, I just want to find out from you, as the founder of Green Africa Youth Organization, you brought together youth, uh, young leaders and entrepreneurs across Africa to address climate challenges. How do, you, how do you think youth leaders can ensure these pledges and initiatives are actually met? Thank you. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to be here. Uh, first of all, I think I would acknowledge some familiar faces I see whom I've worked with and are part of the movement. So very great to see you, uh, Alex from Nigeria, and also Daryl from Ghana. I think it's great that when we have these gatherings, uh, we acknowledge that not the person speaking is the one doing most of the work, but it's always a movement and someone gets selected to speak on behalf of the most of the work that we do. In terms of the role of the youth movement in ensuring some of these heavy pledges and commitment that we see in here, the most essential part for me is the transparency and accountability element of it. I think we are happy to read pledges, we are happy to see commitments, but how do we really measure the progress that comes with it? It's really a big challenge. And I think for many of the young people that I work with, this is where the frustration sets in. It's great that we see our leaders committing to something, institutions, particularly private sector commitments, which typically gives a lot of hope uh, to the work that we do. But once the commitment is made, celebrated afterwards, it's really difficult to get the ball moving and to see that progress. And the role that the youth movement plays is really continuously reminding us that the words have been said, the solutions have been predicted, and already made public, it has to get done. And I think that is the role that we play significantly. The second part is beyond accountability and advocacy that particularly from the African context, many young people tend to become entrepreneurs, not because sometimes they choose to, uh, because you are out of school, you are out of options, you have to do something, so you create something. And sometimes that is the actual scenario that you don't necessarily sit down to say, I'm going to start a company, I'm going to have a startup. But out of a context of lack of employment and no livelihood options for you, you look at your environment, you see what are the possible things you could do to create change, and you start something. 
and eventually you grow passionate to, towards what you're committing your time to. And waste management is one of those sectors where every single week I have a new person contacting me say, we are starting a collection, we are starting processing, we are shredding here, can you connect us to a buyer? Is there a recycling company closer to us? And while there is interest, and a lot of more young people are going into it, I think the challenge is that we are really on a very small part of the equation, which is collect shred. This is mostly what happens across the continent. Most people are collecting and shredding, but how can we have a close loop at the local level? And how do we make it that it can be incentivized beyond the single entrepreneur who starts an initiative and make sure that the everyday person who is collecting, who is gathering, who is transporting, who is at the site cleaning, washing, all of them have a particular value that make that work very meaningful for them because without them, believe me, all of these plans will not work. Without the everyday person who is collecting, who is gathering, who is washing, cleaning, shredding, bailing, all of that process is highly important. But in many cases, funding, resources, and the expertise that we want to bring into the room are those who can really, we think in our heads, can really move them, which is big private sector companies, right? And they have a role to play, but it's very, very important that the informal economy, particularly coming from Africa, and I know this is not just the African narrative, it's also broadly the Global South narrative, that the informal sector is highly important, we need to resource them, we need to fund them, and we need to believe that they can actually host resource and do something great with it. And this is one challenge I face with also many of these other initiatives where there is a new challenge, there's a funding set up, but the funding is calling for innovation, but the innovation is already defined in a way that grassroots informal innovation would automatically not qualify. It has to be something techy, something app-based, or a very sort of innovation definition where it does not allow uh, the informal sector to tap into that. So that is what I think needs to happen. That is what young people in the context of the work I do would want to see. And I challenge all of you to be part of that advocacy to make sure that we advocate for it and we make it happen. Thank you. And Joshua has a seat. So I know this has been a long afternoon. We've had from very different um, institutions you know, same point of view, more or less, but now we would like to hear from you. So I don't know who's going to help me go with the microphone, but I would like to have your hands up. <clears throat> Hi, are you still in the room? No? I, yes, please. So um, hands up, and then we'll just hand over the microphone. So we'll take the first three set of questions to any of our speakers, the people that, you know, that are in front of you, and the one person who's behind here at the front. So. I see three hands, um, four hands. So let's start at that, at that end. I will hand over microphone. Yes, there we go. <clears throat> Those ones, the, 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 the gentleman in the green shirt. I hope that's green. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. My name is Alex uh, Akigbe. I, I, I'm from uh, Nigeria. I work with African Cleanup Initiative. So um, my concern is with the, uh, the gentleman that talked about the EPR. So I'm looking at it from this angle that what can be this long-lasting solution to getting some of these people that produce these items to take responsibility for what they produce. Because most of the times, we, we tend to run after them to even support some of the cleanups and events that we organize. But it's like they are doing us a favor if they support our initiative. And I'm thinking if that should be the uh, mindset some of these people should have. So I'm, I don't know the best approach we can give to it. And also you talked about the collectors too. Okay, I, I also run a recycling firm too in Lagos, Nigeria. And uh, we, we encourage the women, the youth to collect recyclables. Then we collect from them and give them incentive. So I, I don't know if there are better ways we can make them see it not just like a job for themselves, but like they also want to do something good for Mother Earth, like uh, irresponsibility that they need to own up to because they also, in one word, pollute the environment. So I'm just looking at it from a whole uh, larger perspective. Some of our work can be found on the internet. If you Google African Cleanup Initiative, you get to see some of the things we do in Lagos, Nigeria. Thank you so much, Joshua. 
Nice seeing you again. Well done. Thank you, Alex. Uh, to the lady next to Alex, <clears throat> let's keep it short so that we have rapid fire, so we have a selection of questions from all around. So please go ahead. Thank you very much. My name is Gloria Adaba. I'm also from Lagos, Nigeria. I had a recycling company, an environmental company called Remote Global Ventures. Um, my question is just to buttress what he said, especially in the electronic uh, producer's um, uh, responsibility. Because Africa is more of a, uh, they sell their products, they don't actually manufacture there. So there's that clause of responsibility. How do we hold the producers accountable to be um, responsible? Because at the end of the day, their products are used in Africa and they are disposed in Africa. So there is that clause. That's my, just to buttress that. Then uh, my question is for the 50, for two, at, yeah, the 50 Egyptian. by 2050. <laughs> yes, thank yes. you. Uh, it, how is it going to trickle down to countries? Are you going to use the MD, MDB route, um, multinational uh, banks, or uh, are you going to engage private sector di um, directly? So what's the strategy on making it a reality? Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Gloria. We will take one more question so that our panelists don't forget what they, were, what they want to talk about. The gentleman in the green tie. I hope that's green. Just... Hello, uh, my name is Omar. I'm uh, from Egypt. Um, we have a company that works across the whole uh, waste value chain with a holistic view. And uh, my question is to Stephen regarding financing. Um, you were mentioning that you, you've, uh, you've had uh, several different experiences with different countries. Uh, my question to you is, and it's to the whole panel basically, but uh, specifically on the financing, don't you think that it's the challenge that we see when, when you try to include the informal sector as part of the, uh, the whole, uh, let's say, waste management system, is that at the end, the effect is that municipalities and city councils have to, ch they have to get charged a higher price for waste management than if these materials are, are, are channeled through the formal uh, channels. So I just wanted to know from your experience, is that, is that true? Or maybe you have a different view on that? Thank you very much. <clears throat> so in case, just to remind you what's on the table, the questions you have. There's the first one from Alex on EPR, uh, long lasting um, responsibility, taking responsibilities. Uh, then better ways to own up to ensure that there's no polluting. And then Gloria from Lagos um, also asked about electronic uh, waste specifically, looking at resp uh, producer responsibility, but then to, to also the question about 50 by 2050, how does that trickle to country level? The third one from Omar was on um, financing aspects, especially when you start looking at inclu including or ensuring that you work together with the informal sector. How does that affect in terms of pricing? So I would like to start off from that side, from Steven, and then we work our way this way. So first, I'd just like to make sure that we hear from Gareth, because I don't think we've actually heard from him so far. Did I skip somebody? Yes. No, I didn't skip anyone, but you can start with him. Yes, go ahead. Uh, You're putting me in the hot seat, but go ahead. Thank you very much, Andrea. I'm not sure if you had a specific question for me, uh, but um, it, before we answer the questions, if I might just jump in with a couple of points. I'm a climate finance manager at the African Development Bank, uh, and we do have some um, interesting studies that we've been working on around waste management. I'll just mention some initiatives. Uh, very briefly, we, we've done a study on women-led plastic recycling economy, building on a very successful Jeff project in Vietnam that helped um, support women uh, to uh, collect waste and, and, and generate revenues from recycling it. We've recently created an Africa Circular Economy Forum uh, to promote uh, work and development of policies on circular economies. We also recently commissioned a study on methane emissions uh, in relation to the global methane pledge to reduce emissions by 30% by 2030 compared to 2020. And this was a very interesting study that highlighted actually that Egypt was the largest emitting country in Africa of methane from solid and liquid waste management. And the only reason that Egypt showed up like that was because basically they're the only country in Africa that is collecting solid and liquid waste. And Martina, I think, made the point that landfill you know, is, is not the solution, but it's a real threat because it, it, it's, it's how we treat with waste 
uh, as we develop cities and, and urban areas. And we're going to see urbanization in Africa. And if we collect that waste, Africa is going to become a very significant source of greenhouse gas emissions if we don't do it in the right way and use the right policies. Uh, that may include sanitary landfill, but it could include other approaches such as um, recycling and, and uh, uh, circular economy and so on. And the last point to mention is that uh, we have a, a multi-donor trust fund called the Africa Climate Change Fund. And uh, on the back of the work that we did on methane and the fact that we extended the scope of this fund to address the Glasgow Climate Pact, we were able to raise $5 million from US State Department and we will be using that money to support and respond to grants or to provide grants for policy-based studies uh, enabling environment and feasibility studies around methane treatment activities. So this could help uh, municipalities, for example, to develop policies and regulations about open burning, about waste treatment and collection and so on. So we will soon launch, we're, we'll, we hope to raise more money for that and we will soon launch a call for proposals in that area. And now, just briefly on the financing of um, landfill gas projects and, and so on. And I know a bit about this because actually I worked extensively on this under the clean development mechanism under the Kyoto Protocol. And actually in those days, um, waste management was very prominent at these events. And, and we attended events where we brought waste pickers from, uh, from, from developing countries to, uh, you know, to explain how these projects were impacting upon them. And we learned, we, we learned the hard way. You know, you start off with a business model that says, okay, you've got all this waste stream coming in, it's going to generate the methane, we're going to pick out the, uh, all of this, uh, these recyclables. Uh, Omar, this goes to your question, you know, uh, and we're going to generate revenues from all that stuff. But actually, it turns out that all along the chain, those values are being picked out already. Uh, the, 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 the aluminium, the plastics are being pulled out. Uh, in some countries, there were basically mafia uh, that, that ran these, and it was very difficult to, you know, to get involved with that. Um, the, uh, then, then, you know, somebody comes up with a composting project, they take away your organic material, which was the methane, which was to generate the landfill gas to run the power uh, that we were going to make the revenues from. So it's extremely difficult. And Stephen talked about the, um, you know, the, the need to secure your offtake agreements. Uh, and you need to secure the waste stream if you're going to finance these things. So all of these things make it very difficult to finance landfill gas projects. Also, um, when we talk about financing these things in secondary cities, it's very difficult for them to raise finance. They can't borrow money uh, for these kinds of things. They don't have the, the regulatory authority to do that. So raising funds is very difficult. The carbon markets are also very uncertain as for these examples that I gave about the, uh, losing the, the, the organic matter in the supply chain and so on. So that's, that's difficult. The area that I, I think holds the most potential, and we need to do more work around this, is to develop the demand for adaptation. Uh, developed countries have made significant commitments to support adaptation in developing countries. And you might say, what's the link between adaptation and waste? Well, you know, we've seen uh, in, in, in the, the graphic uh, video at the start of the event, uh, the impacts associated with burning waste, uh, the pollution, the impacts on health, um, uh, and so on. If, if a city collects and manages its waste, if it's a clean environment to live in, then it is a more climate adapted environment. In Abidjan, uh, a couple of years ago, we had problems, and we still have problems, where all the plastic, and you see it in many countries, all the plastic drop blocks the rainwater drains. We had flooding, and people drowned because the drains were blocked because of the plastic. So that is an example of how you can look at waste management from an adaptation point of view. Now, Developed countries are not yet providing finance for adaptation, but that is an area that we need to tap into, and we need to extract finance from them to pay for adaptation activities. And, and we have a mechanism called the Adaptation Benefits Mechanism that we are developing at the African Development Bank, which is designed to do this. Uh, and uh, we're working on that. It's still in the pilot phase, but I think there's great potential to use adaptation as a means of providing different kinds of finance to help with the waste management uh, process. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> so I think then I'll take it back to you. Uh, so then the question was about, we'll try and answer this maybe in the next two minutes so that we can have the closing remarks. So you can start, please. It really depends on the size of the system and the type of efficiency or the, the, the goals that you have in mind. So if you have addressing unemployment as one of your key goals, then maybe you do want to somehow figure out how to integrate that community into your solution. One of the things that we've proposed is the segmentation of collection networks within a city, so you establish a district-based model, 
that the bigger players can actually do the bigger parts of this. The microphone died, okay. In a more, in a more, uh, <laughs> in a more efficient manner. All right, let's try this. Okay, in a more efficient manner, but you allow a smaller district to be managed by some of these smaller homegrown or smaller outfits who are then able to put a lot of people to work um, and then they can use the uh, facilities that have been established by some of the bigger players as the off taker for the commodities that they've collected. But I, I take your point that yes, it can be highly efficient in terms of pulling out all of those different valuable commodities and you lose some of that when you try and go to a citywide scale. Thank you very much. So I think I'll call Dr. Nagwar because this was also addressed to you about um, the, inf the uh, inclusion of ensuring that 50 by 2050 will trickle down to country level, city level, municipality level, local communities. Please go ahead. Uh, actually, uh, that is the purpose of 50 by 2050. 50 by 2050 is a holistic approach. So it's not, I'm hearing from each one and every one of us, we look, everyone look at just one part, or it look at the city, or it look at specific type of waste. 50 by 2050 is strategically is gonna be putting a holistic approach, look at the whole issue within five working groups. I hope you were able to get the, uh, the code, the QR code for the brochure. And accordingly, you will be able to identify what's exactly needed, not just technically, technically, financially, uh, all the stakeholders' involvement. We are talking about youth, we are talking about for, for informal sector and how you will be working with the private sector because we need to look at the whole issue as a whole. Don't take it from one aspect or from one corner. And if we look at it this way, I think we are gonna be resolved. One of the major projects we were looking at is e-waste. Actually, why? Because we are a receiver. We, are, we receive and it end up as a dump, in the dump side or it end up as it being dismantled in the incorrect way where it's gonna harm our people, our environment, our health. So this was one of the issue we were looking at from EPR, infrastructure, illegal waste trading, which is very important for Africa. And we were looking at it from legal policy. You are looking at it waste prevention. You are looking at it from data and monitoring, reviewing, and actually accrediting and verifying these data. So it's gonna be looking at everything holistically where it's gonna be covering not just adaptation, adaptation and mitigation. So this is gonna be part of the holistic approach. I hope I answered her question. Yes, thank you very much. I think Joshua, I see you holding the microphone. So final words from Joshua and anyone else on the panel who wants to have final word before we invite um, E. Clay for the closing remarks. Yes, I wanted to quickly uh, compliment a few things based on projects we've done in Ghana. So completely agreeing with you, I think we just finished the research that was linking waste management to flooding in the city of Accra. And it's very obvious that adaptation, resilience, and waste management has a very strong linkage. And I think we need to keep reoccurring that in everywhere we go so that the adaptation finance currently sits a lot really on agriculture for the continent because it's a huge sector that really requires adaptation. But I think waste management plays a significant role. And the second part of that research was also looking at the fact that we still have majority of the waste being organic waste, which supplements the agricultural sector strongly. So if we are able to take the plastics out, we get very good organic waste that we can actually use to support the agricultural sector. So the adaptation value there is really strong and it has to be encouraged. The second part is uh, um, what was talked about around the informal sector and the price that comes along with that uh, from the, the gentleman uh, in Egypt with the experience there. So in Ghana, what we've done is that, I mean, offtake agreements can be done, but the COVID experience showed us that the informal workers has a lot of capacity, but because they, are, they cannot be contracted, because in some contexts they are very disorganized one way or the other, or let's say it's informal, so you cannot actually issue a contract that you say, okay, we give you this amount of money and you deliver these results. 
but through organizing waste workers, we could actually establish optical agreements. We could establish even contract-based agreements where they actually receive money in a way that, like what you said, those along the chain can receive a fair share of money to keep the system moving. On a larger scale, it's very difficult, and I completely agree. And I think that is where we will need private sector support with civil society, working with the municipality, because the municipalities tends to have, they tend to have quite limited capacity in terms of management and oversight to the extent that it becomes a higher cost for them to work with the informal sector. And I think this is really a fundamental place where the, the, the private sector should invest in as opposed to investing in the other end when the waste is already collected and they're interested in, okay, give me the resin and I'll, put, I'll convert it into fresh product. But who has to collect it? Who has to bring it? Who has to clean it and get it ready? And I think that is an important part of which we have to look at. On e-waste, I mean, Ghana has the best uh, case because we have Agboboloshi, which is once the world's largest e-waste dump site. It's, it's chaotic. And there, you know, even if, and I, I, I was part of projects where we set up copper stripping machines, where, which would allow them to really get the valuables out of the electronic waste, they will still burn it, even though there's a copper stripping machine, because they have learned that even being in a queue for five minutes before it's their turn to use that machine, it's faster to burn, it comes with no waiting time, and because to some extent there's an illegal aspect of it, you want to get the material as fast as possible to get the valuables out, and there is no standard price here. So whoever gets the material first, get whatever price that is good at the moment. And I think that that irregularity uh, uh, is something that we're still struggling with. And a way around that, which uh, I believe, I mean, from the work that I've done with these communities, is that everyone at this site is working on money and value. So if there could be a price based on how much they are selling and how much they get, and those price can be set as the standard, then there is sort of less competition between I want to bend because I can reach the buyer much faster and get the money, rather than being in a queue for 15 minutes before I can use a machine, right? So if we could get that, if we could unlock finance, say that we could actually pay the current rates that they get, as opposed to pushing them to do the right thing, which they wouldn't do because they want to get as much money from the product that they have on the market on, at the waste dump site, that, would be, that could be a, a way of going around this. Thank you very much. And so, we are coming rapidly to the end of our session. And I know that you still have questions and you still have comments and there's also an appetite for more information and that will be providing following this session. But um, I would like to invite Dr. Kobe Brand, who has been sitting very quietly waiting. Um, she's Deputy Secretary General for ICLE, Local Governments for Sustainability and Regional Director, ICLE Africa Secretariat. Let's welcome Dr. Kobe Brand. And what a great session, congratulations. Um, it's always for ICLE a fantastic honor and pride to be part of the Marrakesh Roundtables at COPS. And we wish them to go from strength to strength and we'll be there with you all along the way. Talking waste, uh, honestly what we heard here today was so many different perspectives, so many insights. And what I witnessed here was a way that we can interpret this in two ways. I saw a button being passed down. So uh, when, when speakers don't work, so that can be interpreted in my, way, in my mind in two ways. The, the one is, let's just pass the buck, okay? It's somebody else's problem. And we look at, look at ways sectorally. We produce it, the next one transports it, the next one does this, the next one does that. Or it could be, we're a team. We don't actually even know each other. We're from such different sectors, but already we connect. We know that we can do this together, and we do. In fact, today you all told us how we can do this together from different perspective, from a finance perspective, from making the financial case perspective, from starting really with basic principles, as Martina Otto told us. Let's start with organic waste. Organic waste probably in Africa, and I have the stat here, I think organic waste produces close to 70%. Uh, 50 to 70% of all waste in Africa is organic. The, the water people tell me that wastewater is the new gold. Could organic waste be the new gold for us 
if we look at building the new economy, the green economy, should we transform completely our minds in terms of how we look at waste as a value added thing? We know all the three R's. We know circularity is a principle we all have to embrace. Systems-based approaches, mindset changes. We looked at the importance of behavioral change. We heard it, what's possible and what is already happening. And we know that the financial case is difficult to make. It's not easy, but it's there. We know we can aggregate smaller communities, smaller towns to come together and come up with bankable projects that will in interest the AFTB and others to finance. And we know that we need to look for blended financing mechanisms, not easy, but zero-based concessional loans are possible. They are on the table. Um, all sorts of equity versus loans, all sorts of uh, uh, these type of blended financing me mechanisms are coming forth every day. The finance sector is coming to cities. They need to understand the economies are here. They need to understand us better. But we as cities also have a big job to do. We need to start understanding the world of finance a lot more. And then understanding the value that we have in the waste that we produce. And we can become net zero waste cities. We can actually become net positive waste cities and generate an income from it. That is possible. And we see the morsels of that happening around our continent in Africa. I'm excited about that future. But I also know that what is happening today is completely unsustainable. Landfills are not the solution. I live in Cape Town. We are out of landfill space. And we don't have really alternatives in, in place at the moment. So it's, it's all of these things together. Every single decision every one of us make every day at every level, whatever position we are in, that's how we're going to get it done. And that's why we have to work together. We embrace... We are already signed up as ICLI to 50 by 2050. We're looking forward to be working with you on this. We embrace the CCAC. We are already part of that. Let's work together. Let's come together also to embrace the new initiatives that are coming forth, the surge initiative the Urban Resilience Initiative that will be launched by the COP presidency next week here at COP27, a historic moment where urbanization is really coming forth at the Climate COP for the first time, and waste is part of that parcel. So let's embrace the solutions that we know exist, but more than that, let's embrace this collective, common, shared value that we have here. And let's not underestimate the value of partnerships. For ICLI, this is how we roll. And I think for waste, this is the only way we can roll. Thank you very much for a very, very compelling session. Really, the Marrakesh Roundtables provide solutions and food for thought and rich dialogue that doesn't have to stop here when the session ends. Let's bring this message also to the rest of the COP in the days ahead, and next week especially, when the focus is going to be on urban. So thank you very much also to the Climate Champions, to the Marrakesh Partnership and everybody here. It's been a wonderful and productive session. Thank you very much. So before I declare the session closed, I'd like to remind you that you are in Africa, so we're gonna give you a little bit of something of how we end sessions. So how we normally do the clapping at the end is, <clears throat> this is a Kenyan thing, maybe it'd be a lot of other African countries. So I want you to warm it up, because it's been a cold room, it's colder than you know, the outside, so warm it up. And then when I finish warming up, you do the one, like a thunder clap, and we give it to them. So, are we ready? Warming, warming, thunder clap, Give it to them. End of session. Thank you very much.